Uh, welcome everybody, uh, both here in the room and uh, those of you uh, online, to a very special event in the university's calendar, the 2021 Chalmers Oration. First, uh, I'd like to invite uh, to the stage our Ghana elders, Uncle Lewis Yellowberg O'Brien and Uncle Michael O'Brien for Welcome to Country. Thank you. Marawi Janga, Ghana, me and I Wangani, Mani Nabundi Ghani Adana. Naibira Ko, Mankalakala, Tandanya, me and Aku. Nature Yungandalia, Nature Yakanandalia, Padni Adlu Wadu. On behalf of the Ghana people, I welcome you all to Ghana country, and I do this ambassador of the Adelaide Plains people. My brothers, my sisters, let's walk together in harmony. Natalia. Natalia. You're probably wondering why my father is not dressed up. Well, because I've stolen his cloak, his feathers <laughs> and his shield, so only one of us can wear it. But it's wonderful to not only hear the words of my father and uh, when he uses language who helped uh, reclaim our language, but to also to follow in his footsteps and to learn from him. And uh, you'll know I'm uh, his son because my father was a great storyteller and I want to tell you a story, a story that hopefully enables us to, to connect uh, with what we're here to do, which is to listen to these wonderful people and speak about uh, certainly not just only culture, but the importance of health. And uh, this story is a story where this great elder sat in his humpy. And in the humpy, he was staring at a mukundu being the computer, or as we would say, the lightning brain. And on the side of that computer was a government man who was talking to him. And he asked the great elder this question. He said, great elder, you've seen the loss of your land, the destruction of your culture, the loss of your language. You've seen ceremonies being stopped. You've seen the children being stolen. Many people lose their lives. Poor health, poor education, poor unemployment, poor housing. He said, where did we go wrong? And the great elder, he paused for a moment. And he said, before colonisation, he said, the land, it was free. He said, the food was free. He said, the medicines were free. He said, we'd had very little sickness and our men would hunt, make things. Our women would give birth to our children and teach them and care for them. And at night time, we'd make love. What idiot would muck around with a system like that? And it's important to understand because I find it fascinating that we now live in this world that gives us so much more than what we need, we have a lot of wants. And I think when we understand that story, the odd thing is I was listening to a futurist the other day and the funny thing is he was saying that technology will take our place. So what does that mean for us? Well, it means, as I see it, as our people have always believed, you only take the things that you need, which is you need housing, you need food. You need good health and you need good family and community. And that's what we'll be again one day. And I look forward to that day when really not only the values of culture, but the values of each of us, if we really truly look within ourselves, is about only having what we need, not what we want. So it's wonderful that we can come together to learn and to share because that's what it's all about. And I hope that that story in some ways uh, connects with you and has some meaning to you because when we look into stories and meanings, then we truly find ourselves and the knowledge and wisdom that we search for. So nakata and naitaya. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Uncle Lewis and Uncle uh, Mickey. 
I'd like to also uh, pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging uh, here on the traditional lands of the Ghana people uh, and also acknowledge all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander uh, people in the room or online, but also to acknowledge that one of uh, Flinders' privileges and indeed responsibilities is that we work uh, and research and educate across many traditional lands and I'd like to pay my respects to the traditional custodians across South Australia and into the Territory um, and in particular pay my respects to uh, the Larrakia people uh, of the saltwater people of Darwin uh, where Uncle Richie is from and also pay my respects to uh, Waterman Dagaman and, and uh, Jawan people from the Catherine region uh, where Auntie uh, Millie Wonga is from. So just a little bit about the Chalmers oration a bit in context. So John Chalmers, uh, who unfortunately, unfortunately isn't able to be here today, he's, he's stranded in Sydney uh, because of these uh, COVID-related events, as you can imagine. Uh, welcome, John. I know that you're here. It's fabulous that you're able to join us uh, online, but it's great to have Helen and Michael uh, uh, representing you here. Uh, and it's also great, of course, to have you, Alex Bune, uh, John's wife, also uh, watching us. So John uh, Chalmers AC was the first professor of medicine here at Flinders, was for a long period of time and had a really critical role in integrating both the university and uh, the Flinders Medical Centre. He's had a profound impact, particularly in the area of hypertension, and is still uh, probably the most active uh, octogenarian researcher that I know anywhere in the world. Um, as you can see by this list, there are a number of very distinguished uh, orators over the years. I want to draw your attention to 2018 Sir Peter Radcliffe. Peter uh, actually uh, won the Nobel Prize the following year. So uh, we're in very distinguished company and with Alex Brown and Nicholas Spurrier. But I have to say that, uh, frankly, what we're going to experience over the next 45 minutes and 50 minutes would be, uh, would be right up there with um, uh, in terms of knowledge and transition of knowledge from a Nobel Prize winner of that, there is no doubt. So tonight's format is a little bit different to the standard oration, and it's v very exciting not only to see people uh, here online, but also I think you'd agree that the, um, the presentation is just looking absolutely stunning. Uh, we're very privileged to have our fabulous uh, uh, Associate Professor Simone Turr, Pro Vice Chancellor Indigenous, and one of our elders on campus, Uncle Richie Fijo, Senior Elder on campus, and uh, Larrakia Elder are facilitating a discussion with our orators. Without further ado, I'll hand it over to them to introduce um, uh, our orators. Thank you. So thank you, Jonathan. So welcome everyone. Um, my name is Simone Walalga Tur. I'm from the Yungle Jada community and I'd also like to thank Uncle Lewis um, and Mickey O'Brien for offering the wonderful welcome to country. Um, I do that as a young Jada woman who is out of country but have lived on Ganayata for all my life. Um, I'm very pleased to be able to uh, co um, chair this wonderful oration today with Uncle Richie Fijo, as um, Jonathan mentioned, our elder on campus um, from the Larrakia Nation. Um, it's wonderful to be here with the Chalmers family as well. We're excited and we're honoured to introduce this year's Chalmers oration speakers, Annie Milliwonga Sandy Werben and Stuart McGrath. So a bit more about Annie Milliwonga. So Millie Wonga Sandy, culturally referred to as Auntie Millie Wonga, is a Rembaranga woman who grew up on the Baranga and Wugula Indigenous communities southwest of Catherine Northern Territory. Auntie Millie Wonga is a traditional healer 
and herbalist, as well as an acclaimed artist and weaver. Ani Miliwonga's role as a traditional healer is recognised in Aboriginal communities here in Australia and internationally. And Ani Mili connects her works alongside First Nations spiritual healers across the globe. As a teacher and mentor, Ani Miliwonga is continually teaching, advising, and leading others to learn more about Aboriginal culture, healing, and wellbeing. Ani Miliwonga is passionate about sharing her knowledge to support intergenerational change. It gives her great joy to be able to teach and share her knowledge with all children, both Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal, and to learn more about the world's longest continuing culture in the world, the culture of Australia's First Peoples. Ani Milawonga is supported by Maddie Bauer and Kylie Stothers. And a little bit about Maddie. So Maddie works in the Northern Territory Medical Program at Catherine Campus and is a lecturer in Indigenous Health. Maddie has lived in Catherine in all her life with family extensions out to Barclay Region, Borroloola, Alice Springs, Tennant Creek and Elliott Peoples. Kylie, Kylie Stothers was born and raised in Catherine, Northern Territory and is a proud descendant of the Jarwin people. Kylie is a proud mother and comes from a large extended family with strong ties in Catherine and surrounding communities. Kylie is currently the Director of Workforce Development at the Indigenous Allied Health um, Australia, IHA, and is a social worker who has worked throughout the Northern Territory for over 20 years. So please make them feel welcome. My name is Richard Fijo. I'm the senior elder on campus of Flinders University. I'm also here today to support Stuart McGrath. Firstly, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners and the custodians of the land we're on, the Ghana people, and pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. A little bit about Stuart. I'm, I'm really honoured to be here and present Stuart today. Um, Stuart is a young old man, recognised as the NT Young Australian of the Year in 2021. Stuart is an Aboriginal health practitioner, currently completing a Bachelor of Nursing. Upon graduation, he will be the first Yolngu registered nurse. In addition to his studies, Stuart helped produce the Ask the Specialist podcast with the Menzies School of Health and Research to improve communications between health professionals and patients, demonstrating his commitment to patient care. A natural leader, student, a student is committed to closing the gap between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians. His passion for helping his community will inspire other First Nations young people to participate in the health workforce, uh, leading to happier and healthier lives. So welcome, Stuart. I'll give you a bit of a tap before yeah. <laughs> So before we commence the Q&A panel discussion with both Ani Miliwonga and Stuart, um, we'll, they will spend some time sharing about their work in the community and what they're passionate about. Um, we will begin with Ani Miliwonga, but before we begin um, our, the sharing of Ani Miliwonga and Stuart's stories, we do ask as part of um, cultural protocol that you don't take any photos um, or videotape this particular session as our orators share their personal stories. So thank you, Ani Miliwonga. You. Yeah. Uh, first of all, I would like to acknowledge and pay respect to uh, the people of this land. I want to thank you for welcoming us and pay respect to your ancestral spirits of the land and your ancestors, you know, uh, of the past and of the present. Thank you. My name is Miriwanga and I wear many hats, but for today, we are just going to see uh, what I have to share. Ma. This to look at the garden that medicine, we have. Um, it's all. Stop first. This, is, this is a garden that we women, the Barnacle Strongbala Women's Group, 
are created and it has all the traditional medicines, traditional dyes and the fruits and nuts that we eat. And with the help of a lady, uh, she helped us to grow these plants, nurture them, you know, from seed. And this is the garden that we have, which is 60 Ks, uh, southeast of Catherine, called Banachal, or the King Valley in English. To look at the Western medicine, um, it's all fixing the physical body. The traditional medicine, it is not only dealing with the physical body, but also the spiritual body as well. That, that is so significant um, part of our traditional medicine, because a lot of the traditional medicines are used by traditional healers. It is that knowledge that have been passed down, you know, um, through our ancestors, like we say back in the dream time. And it is that knowledge that have been carried on, you know, through our, our foremothers. And to this day we have it and so we're, we're passing the knowledge again uh, to this young new generation of people that are coming to be. And then from there, it goes on again. You know, it's a continuation of, of passing down the knowledge of traditional medicine that has always been part of us. Traditional healers are similar to what you would call Druids who come from England. Now, Druids were traditional healers as well as herbalists, they were healers and herbalists. And so we too are healers and herbalists using traditional medicine, traditional roots and leaves and barks, you know, grass. So we are like the druids. So, thank you, Arnie. Um, we'll now uh, welcome Stuart to share his story with us. Right? So, did you want to talk some more, Arnie? Um, we have some the more slides. Sorry. Slide, yeah. Yeah. She's still got more slides. Here you go. Yeah, this is, um, as you can see up there, um, I am working with one of the ladies who has pain on her hand using the medicine like these bottles you see in front of us here. So um, the bush medicine, you know, we've come so far with it and it's always been with us. Uh, we would never go without our medicine even though we you know, <clears throat> grew up in places like a settlement, you know, reserves. We, we still used our traditional medicine, but in a secret way, so, because our parents were afraid that, you know, they would find out and the police would hunt them down, so they were always cautious when using traditional medicine because people have always downtrodden our medicine as being evil and um, it's not good and you have to come and take this medicine. But we've had them way before uh, clinics, you know, started in our community. It was what uh, we always had, not, not the medications that people have today. So with the medicine, bush medicine, um, we make our bush medicine and give to schools so that the children can use. Um, the very significant of one of the medicine is the lemongrass, the native lemongrass. And that is a very strong antibiotic that we use, but it also 
helps um, with children that are so active in class. It, it calms down, you know, it calms them down and settles them down, you know. And the, the medicine helps that child so that he isn't rushing around or shouting or running around, you know, in class. So we use a lot of our medicine in our community clinics as well. As you can see in the pictures there, uh, apart from the medicine, we teach a lot of people, you know, both indigenous and non-indigenous people, taking workshops like yarning circles, and teaching people, you know, so that they understand what, what both way teaching is all about, uh, what is balance to us, because in our, in our culture, balance has always been part of us, you know, our, our people. Balance has always been in every area, you know, of work, whether it's uh, families, uh, you know, the plants and animals, which is part of us, our kinship relationship and all those, all those things that we have. And apart from that, I've always worked with Miriam, as you can all see. Miriam teaches study. She is from Daily River. And she's the senior Australian of the year. Yes, yeah, she's Tele the senior uh, woman senior or Australian. senior Australian of the year. Of the year. Yeah. This is Miriam. So um, she dedicated that you know, the gift that she was given, she dedicated that to all indigenous women of Australia. And that was so wonderful of her to do that. So I work with her sometimes when there are too many people that come up from down south. So we do a lot of, uh, we do a lot of, you know, meditation and I teach uh, traditional spirituality with, that actually comes under uh, the healing, you know, therapies, counselors like you have, you know, in in your culture. We have all those too. And this comes under our traditional spirituality. Like you heard earlier, everything that we do is spiritual. Even the work we do on people that are sick is spiritual. We would not work on people, um, you know, as healers. We, we cannot work if we're just doing it in the physical now. Because healing goes back in line, you know, from ancestral time to the generation of, of that line of healers. So our families have always been healers on, on my line as well, including my grandchildren, my daughters, you know. This design you see there, it is what we call Ngalandako. Ngalandako literally means uh, mother-child. That is actually the universal balance that I teach in traditional spirituality. That holds the entire culture, our kinship relationship, you know, skin groupings, like we have our skin grouping here as we sit here. And the position that we're sitting here, we've had to sit like this. So over there we have uh, Mary, she is Kamenjan. This one here, she's opposite to Stuart. So they become sister and brother, so they cannot sit beside each other. So I am their mother, I'm related to them as mother. And then you have Richard there, who is Balang, like his brother who was married to one of my first cousins. So the position where we sit, it's okay. Providing that the sister doesn't sit next to, to the brother of first cousins as well. So all that we have in there, 
that is a moiety as well. Yiricha and Dua, where everything, all things come under. So here we have Dua, Yiricha, Dua, Yiricha, Dua. So the Dua represents the yellow color. The red represents us, the Dua people. The yellow represents the Yiricha people. But everything is according to that balance. Everything is balanced. Our laws, our laws for animals, plants, the cosmos, our kinship relationship, everything that we have here, those string bag, the string bag and the basket also have their, their, um, their skin groupings. They also hold the laws, as well as this one here. You want to lift him up? Yeah. This is his mother's dreaming. And that is the shark liver. But he has all, he has all the rights to represent the mother. So he is therefore called the Jungai. So all our children, they are our Jungai. They have the rights, you know, of our land, our song line, our dance line, and everything. Guardians, guardians. Yeah, and guardians. They are our guardians for everything, including our land, our dreaming, and our totem, and our language. So that is Ngalandaku. We would sit here for a very long time, so I'm going to pass that. It has a lot. Mm -hmm. Keep going. Yeah, ma. Can you uh, finish, uh, yeah. finish. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. Well, right. thank you. Kinship is really important, but so is healing for our people and our community. So with that, we'll um, invite Stuart to share your story with us. Please. Thank you, Amla. Yo. Um, yo. Yo. Muru yang ada dua buku guru pan dua luang awak tahu ni mana? Paman gue, kawal ngamir dua ni naga, kayu tamir, dua mirchi ga nama la. Thank you. Just acknowledging the TIs, past, present, and future. Um, yeah. So my name is Stuart. Stuart McGrath. Uh, McGrath is not a young name. Obviously, <laughs> so my because my father's white, um, and my mother is a Galpo Kurui woman from Elko Island, East Arnhem Land. Um, her formal identity is Balpalo Namambela Guaroko. That I cannot translate to you, <laughs> and I'll tell you why. It's very, very entrenched academically in the Yorongo society that it has no equivalence in the Western world. Um, and my formal identity is But I like the intro from the Google, Rigi. That's cool, but that's my formal identity. It means the crocodile who lays in the nest of fire. And that's my driver. Fire is where I was forged in, and that's my driver to success and aspirations in life. Um, so there's the picture of me. I don't know if people like ScoMo, but that was in on the 26th of January. I met up with him at the Parliament House. Um, and there's me in the middle uh, with my two daughters. So uh, 10 and 11, I'm, I'm a single father of two, two girls and two of my cousins. That was during a funeral. Um, so in funerals, we don't really go to churches in one day and, and bury the deceased and then go home. That, that went on, that funeral went on for a week, for one week. We sleep with the deceased and we do ceremonies every day and night. That was in Millinginby uh, to a neighboring tribes. Um, so we have to, 
keep re-engaging with other tribes to, to keep the connections and the peace. Um, so, yeah, I grew up in a place called Matamata. It's uh, in the mainland, not far from Elko Island. Probably six houses and one school. No television, no technology. Uh, my teacher was my grandmother and um, my mother. Um, and then we would have the white teacher fly in once a week. Um, so, yeah, that's where I learned how to speak English, I guess you could say. I learned a few things. Bottle of water, sunglasses and all those. Very complex things. Uh, yeah, so when I, I was 14 when I started to speak English. English is in my first language. Um, so I perfected that language when I was 14. Um, but then I moved to Galloway or Elko Island. I lived in a community there. I did uh, Western education there, primary school. And, uh, lived in poverty, though, you know, overcrowding, probably eight to ten boys in the same room with my cousins. Um, no, not much food. Sometimes I'd go to the shops and steal food or go into white people's yards and steal watermelons and pawpaws from the backyard. Um, so, yeah, pretty hard life. Um, yeah, so I, um, I did... I wanted change. I, I suffered... Um, you know, all the typical diseases that come in remote communities. So I, I was suffering anemia. Um, for those of you who doesn't have health background, anemia is due to uh, iron deficiency. What's in iron? Meat. So there was no meat, there was no food. So I suffered that illness, uh, typical community illnesses. Um, so I decided not to do that. So uh, I signed up to... Uh, go down in Canberra two years in high school. And then I finished my college year 12 in Darwin. Um, and that's, that's how I ended up in uni, I guess. Um, anyway, I'll keep going. Um, yeah. um, so there's, there's the team that I was involved in. Um, in my research with Menzies, we got an award. Um, so there was Larakia Elder, um, Yolngo, and Tiwi Elders that I did the research with, based around Royal Down Hospital. Um, so <coughs> the research was done on Larakia country. This topic was on um, Aboriginal people's experience of cultural safe care with interpreters at Royal Darwin Hospital. Um, it was done by myself um, as a associate investigator and a PhD student, Vicky Kerrigan. Um, so we teamed up with um, Top End Health Service and Aboriginal Interpreting Services. Oh, where are we? Sorry, guys. Um, so we did this in RDH Renal Ward, um, the mainly uh, widely spoken languages, Yolongmata and, and Tiwi languages. So we went with the patients from those two languages and the interpreters embedded in the renal team. Um, our aim for this research was to explore the impact of consistent access to Aboriginal interpreters on patients and how cultural safety fits under that umbrella. Um, so, yeah, so we were trying to analyse how cultural safety fits in that realm of language and how it can affect the consistent engagement in the health system if you reject the languages. Because languages is not just interpreting, guys. It's culture, it's identity, it's everything. It's motions, it's soul. And that's why I wanted to do this qualitative 
research. Um, a culturally safe service is actively mindful and respectful towards indigenous cultures and strengths and their differences. Culturally safety, uh, cultural safety advocates for changing systems. And that is what I intend to do, guys, for a lifetime, right? This will probably take another 100 years. I know I won't close the gap in my lifetime, but you know what? My descendants probably sleep at night after when I'm gone. Um, yeah, so changing systems and attitudes which enables transfer of power from services that provide to the healthcare consumers by that as an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander patients. Um, it should be free of racism. That's what cultural safety means in my perspective. Um, you, you see, cultural safety should not involve you as a health professional should leave your beliefs and perception based on your Western dominant culture and, and how you see this world mm -hmm. in this country. Because only the patients can determine whether your health service is culturally safe. Yep. So am I good with time? How am I going? Huh? <laughs> um, okay, next. So who we worked with, uh, six patients, five of them were Yulunga, one Tiwi, three Royal Down Hospital doctors, uh, specialists and two registrars. Um, there were five anti um, Aboriginal interpreters and like I said, two Yulung Mata interpreters, two interpreters, and a trained uh, inter uh, observant uh, who was the coordinator for interpreters. Uh, me and Vicky did, Vicky is a PhD student who I worked with. We did 17 interviews before, during, and after the pilot. 30 hours of observation across seven days. Doctors also uh, did their own journals, and we as the uh, field workers took notes, etc. Um, so, where am I going? Yeah, so what we found was that 84% of renal patients were Aboriginal. 84%. Bit scary, isn't it? Um, and 78% spoke one or more Aboriginal languages. 15 Aboriginal languages were spoken just in that renal ward, we found out. Uh, but mostly spoken in Yolngu and Tiwi. Uh, we were there for 17 days, and that's how we, many we counted in that period. Um, so there's more than 15 languages, because that's measured by the Western ways. The reason I say that is more than 15 languages, because in my language, Yolngu Mata, I can understand six different dialects. So that's not even correct but I had to play their game and go buy their books. Um, we found out nine Aboriginal patients spoke only English, um, and one in particular emphasised she lost her Larrakia language as a result of colonisation. So we had uh, one Yolngu elder, um, the reason I want to share Matthew's story, Matthew, is because really shows the experience of Aboriginal language speaker at RDH when they are forced to speak English and after they are able to communicate in their first language with an interpreter. So obviously Matthew is not his real name. We're going by the alias. Um, his home was in East Arnhem Land, about 650 kilometres away from the hospital um, in Darwin. Uh, this patient had been a patient in RDH on and off for over five years, so roughly 10, almost 10, mostly under the care of renal team, um, but was also treated for other chronic disease illnesses. Um, he had a reinfection, which the health providers found hard to diagnose because it was in the English-speaking hospital system for so long that Matthew actually said he was worried he was going to lose his language. Um, without an interpreter, Matthew wondered why health prov providers did not use plain English. Um, and one of his quotes, uh, I sometimes wonder to myself, are there simpler words they can use or maybe I can understand? Uh, 
Uh, so Matthew, Matthew had a reputation as very abusive and very aggressive. He was labeled the angry man. Staff asserted that he understood English very well and he was just deliberately obstructive. Some, some staff argued with Matthew, he said his English was more reliable than it was said in Yorumata through an interpreter. Uh, that's one of the doctors. Um, okay, where are we? So that's one of the codes from um, one of the doctors that that was part of the research I was analysing. So that was me, SYM, interviewing him. Can you guys read that? Yeah. You see that? This uh, angry, obstructive man was praying to God on his bed in the hospital for the nurses and the doctors and for himself so they can all culturally be competent and understand each other. This angry man was praying to God for, for his health, health providers. So Matthew received access to Yulumata interpreters 17 times across that 17 days. Uh, some days Matthew saw an interpreter twice if tension was required for medical staff. Um, he was getting more confident. Um, he was more forceful with his treatment and making decisions. And you can see one of his quotes there. Yes, I was more forceful with my treatment and making decisions and also, I had more choices. I was more forceful, making decisions based on things I wanted. It wasn't that he couldn't speak English. He just couldn't articulate his feelings and the complexity of his pain in English. He needed his first language for that. So this is all encrypted. I interviewed this patient in my language. Then I translated all this and did the coding in the um, research. That's why he could express himself like this. So he, he came from stuck to satisfied. At the start, Matthew was really upset. He wasn't angry. He was frustrated, distressed, and misunderstood. That's all. You, you see, interpreters are just, they're just not linguistic translators. They are cultural brokers, and trust is huge. The interpreters also not only help the patient, but the clinicians understand of the, of the person's background. Not sympathy, empathy. Differentiate those two words. It's pretty hard to, it's easy to mix them, you know. So there's all these quotes. So there it is, guys. I did a podcast. This went 15,000 times downloaded. That was intended for, in, that was intended for problems in Royal Down Hospital. 15,000 times, six months, under six months. This was done. This was downloaded in Italy, Switzerland, Uganda, US, and Canada. So it shows you cultural safety is not even a problem in Royal Down Hospital. It's a worldwide issue, guys. Yeah. Um, so the topics under this um, podcast was getting to know your patient, communicating with your patient, communicating with the interpreters and your patient, patient-centered care, informed consent, recognizing and addressing racism, and perspe perspectives on health and well-being. You can download this. I'm doing the promoting now. You can download this <laughs> on <laughs> iTunes, <laughs> iTunes and Spotify. Ask the Specialist. Now, the reason we called it Ask the Specialist is I wanted to change and flip that power. Cardiologists, you know the specialist. The patient is the specialist for their own body and their culture and their background. So I shifted that power, then I called it Ask the Specialist. And then out of that, this year I became a co-author and made two publications. So there you go, I'm the second author.
Um, and these two publications and the research is the only one that's done in Australian hospital, and that happens to be Royal Down Hospital. That's, that's me. Yeah. So thank you so much to Ani, Miliwonga and Stuart for those incredible sharing of their stories, kinship system, importance of culture, um, the importance of interpreters beyond just the idea of interpreting English, but it's actually that important cultural context and way of knowing. Um, I've, it's just incredible to hear the, the words that you've shared um, today. So can we just thank them again? <laughs> so now we have an opportunity um, where Uncle Richie and myself will be asking Annie Miliwonga and Stuart some questions. We'll see how many we get through. We'll just um, check how much time we do have to continue the oration, given we started a little bit late. But we are going to start firstly, Ani Mili, is the first question that I'm going to ask you, Ani Mili Wonga. And some of the information was a bit shared in that beautiful video that you had also about being on country and the importance of bush medicine. But Ani Mili Wonga, we just wanted to ask about um, the process of um, traditional healers um, passing that knowledge from generation to generation, if you could share us um, that information about the important process of what that means when you pass that knowledge of traditional healing and herbalist um, down to future generations. Yeah, it is very important and so valuable uh, in, in what we hold so dear. In a healer's family, it is passed on spiritually, you know, to the children. We watch them grow up. Uh, we will see things happening, you know, and say, ah, this one has that gift. So it runs in the family line. Uh, I cannot come to Flinders University and, and learn about, you know, medical stuff. It's not like that at all. Our system of being traditional healer has always been from the family during the dream time when it first began. So I have um, a line of my forefathers, foremothers, who were also very powerful healers. And so we came out of that from them. Um, I, I cannot teach uh, someone to become a healer. It, it does not work that way. It is spiritually given to us. And so we see it in our children as well. Even when they are crawling, we will know that they have that gift. At other times, some of the grannies may not have that gift, but they are gifted with something else, you know. And it is, yeah, very important for us to continue with that and to be able to have it shared in schools and maybe your university here, working side by side with, with the medical um, scholars, and, you know, professors, all those people. And students, you know, having them to teach them to know the knowledge of, of the balance that we have within these areas yeah. of healing. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Annemili Wonga. I know when I first um, got to meet um, Annemili Wonga that this year in in Darwin, I felt very connected because my my late grandmother was a Ngangari, an Aboriginal healer, um, and so I felt very connected to. Um, Ani Milawonga when we met. So thank you so much for sharing that important knowledge about generational transmission. Um, first, apologise for cutting in before. I wasn't sure whether you had finished your presentation or not. Um, acknowledge you though. Respect, always. Yeah, but then 
You have to see it too because everything here yeah, Balanda waste. So we're all mixed up. <laughs> Balanda made non Aboriginal. So, yeah, so not our fault really. No, all good, all good. Sorry. So, so my question then is for Stuart, as a young person who was recognised for your leadership, who has uh, guided and supported you? Um, oh, that's a hard one. I'm not sure. I um. I don't know. I could say I'm self-made. Mm. Nothing wrong with that. The streets of Galunku made me where I get to here today. Yeah. You know? Mm. So, yeah, like living in poverty and dysfunction, I had... Probably took me 15 years to get to this place where I'm at now. So I didn't really... Actually, maybe when I had my two daughters, I, um, I was 18. Yeah, don't do that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's when I realised I was like yep my piding days are over I was 18 when my eldest daughter was conceived uh, that kind of made me rethink my life I had to grow up real quick and I was like All right, I need to establish myself uh, for betterment of my children's lives so they kind of inspired me and motivated me so yeah my daughters guided me I guess well, I've got to say, you're pretty awesome, and the young Australian. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so you did quite Do well right. yourself. <laughs> no, thank you so much, um, Stuart. So I'm just going to ask Ali Millie Wonga another question, and it's probably um, a question that we really want to challenge in terms of the Western medical system. And so, Ali Millie Wonga, what messages do you want to tell to Western practitioners about the importance of traditional healing? Well, the importance and uh, the importance of sharing our traditional medicine uh, with the Western medicine uh, would be, you know, very good. Good about using our traditional medicine rather than the Western medication, which a lot of our old people never took. In fact, my my mom never ever took, uh, you know, Western medicine, even though we had a small clinic that was started in a community, Wugula. She never would ever take those medicine. Even painkillers, you know, we say, they've got these painkillers. Come on, old girl, take it. It takes that pain away, you know. Uh, but she would refuse and say, I have my own medicine. Or even if um, the health worker we had there, one of her grandson would come around, you know. There was a time when they would go to all the elders and, and do obs, you know, on them. And my mom would refuse that and say, you take all your stuff and go away from my home. Um, and my mom passed away without, you know, taking all those things. She stuck to her traditional ways, which um, helps me to really focus into my traditional medicine. Uh, my mom was an inspiration for me. When, when it came to traditional medicine. I use both Western and traditional medicine even today. But a lot of the time, if people do want, you know, healing, traditional healing, then they normally come over and, and ask me to do healing on them. And it's not only my countrymen, but a lot of the non-indigenous people come to uh, like Catherine. They come and want to be healed as well. I see the importance here is working together, you know, collaborating in workshops like we've always done in all those past years, you know, with, with Allied Health. Having all these students come together, it doesn't matter whether they, 
uh, what university you come from or, or colleague, you know, or even if you're just um, like in a community, being a health worker, it doesn't matter, or training as a nurse, you know, in a university. But we've had all these students come and we've had to share with them, you know, that both were knowledge of medicine. Because we have similar protocols and we have um, similar cases of illnesses, you know, and what we are able to do, uh, you know, for that specific illness. And this is where we need to bring it that balance now and work together rather than just seeing and focusing on one side of, of medicine. Well, we've had this medicine way, way before doctors came here. We've always had it with us. Now we want to share that. Now we want to, to be able to give you, you know, the, the structure of a traditional medicine. How does it work? You know, Kojokia, uh, he goes to study in the Western uh, way, you know, to become this so that they will know, aha, he's, he's a proper nurse, which is very good, you know. And then we have others, young people who, who are traditional uh, healers as well. And if they could come, you know, and be with the young people and work together, you know, and diagnose these illnesses, you'd be surprised what these traditional healers can do. Yeah. Um, I might last one more question. I think we've got about four minutes left each, so maybe I can ask this to both of you. And I'll start with Stuart. Um, and if we could answer in about two minutes, maybe. What does a, healthy, a happier and healthy life mean from a Yolngo perspective? And for Ani, I would ask you, what does a happy and healthy life mean from the uh, perspective of a traditional healer? So maybe if Stuart can, uh, so in the Jungo perspective, what does happy, healthy life mean for you? For you? On a Jungo perspective? Jungo culture way. Um, so I think wealth and health can kind of overlap. Um, what I picture when you say that, well, thriving in, in careers, education, um, in culture um, and, and wealth and embracing all of it together. Because um, there's a lot of people that are, are reluctant to, to embrace this uh, mainstream society. Where I come from, they are really reluctant to embrace this in fear of culture being diluted. And so they get really uh, scared to branch out to the outside world. Um, hence why I got painted up here. This is to demonstrate. I may be in research, I may be in academia, but it doesn't mean I lose my identity. There's other races that come from other countries and they embrace their culture. It's Indians, Asians, Greeks, whatever. They come to Australia and they embrace this urban society, the Australian society, and still maintain their culture and identity. And that is what I intend to de demonstrate to my people. My brother. <laughs> yes. And so, Annie, over to you. Well, traditional healer, what does happy, healthy life mean for you? Well, Speaking spiritually um, as a traditional healer, we've always seen, you know, first it was always the well-being of our people. The healers have always been there to see the well-being of a family, you know, children, our elders, those who, who were always sick. Well-being is the very important um, thing that we can have in, in our culture. And it's not only that, but there is a 
healing therapy that comes in when, you know, family all get together and that is a healing therapy process. Family coming together, you know, and they they dance, they sing and they laugh, you know, tell dream time stories uh, to the children. And it's also an education for the children as they, they are being surrounded by adults, you know, uh, talking. And being happy is what uh, we're accustomed to, really. There has never been um, a time where, you know, we all become unhappy, although uh, fearfully we, our countrymen have had that fear of this COVID-19, you know. But then it settled among our families. So they don't think of it very much, except that they have to be aware, you know, of what's happening. Um, being happy, being happy is having that balance in everything that, that we have. Our ceremonies, our song lines, our dance line, you know, and our totems, our storylines. And we are just happy in what we have. We don't have much, very much to give, but I tell you, we are rich in what we have to give spiritually. And that is, you know, the discipline, teaching, and wisdom of all things in which balance comes from. Yo. Oh. So we'd now like to um, thank Annie Miliwonga and Stuart for what I can say has been an incredible presentation. It's been an honour to have um, Maddie, Kylie, um, Annie Miliwonga, Stuart, Uncle Richie, Cass down there, Marie, who had to leave today um, in Yungarindi. And it's been a really special time to host you, to sit with you, to um, support you with the presentation today. I can't say I feel so honoured and so humble to be sitting in front of our incredible knowledge holders. And I just want to ask everyone online, by yourself in your room, <laughs> and um, in the... in. Uh, in here to actually thank them again. We're sorry that we weren't able to have questions. Um, for those in the room, you may have an opportunity to come up and speak to our generous um, orators. Um, for those who are on Slido, um, please, if you do have a question, leave your name and a contact detail. We may be able to get back to you with that question. But this is the end of our oration. Thank you so much again for being with us. Thank you, Uncle Lewis and Nikki, for our beautiful ceremony before we began our oration. So thank you and have a wonderful night. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>